In the space of a week, Chelsea have gone from winning 4-1, but actually kind of losing, to drawing 4 all and actually kind of winning. What to make of that eight-goal thriller? I'm joined by John McKenzie. Hello. Right, it was very chaotic, wasn't it? All it was... over the place. Why? Well, I think what we've seen from Chelsea this season is that when teams are going to come out and press them quite high, what they're going to try and do is play very direct. So Man City are a team who are going to press quite high um, and all of the elite teams are, which is why I think we've seen Chelsea perform quite well against some of the better teams. But in this game, we saw them pressing right up the field, uh, leaving lots of space at the back to attack. And the way that Chelsea were going to try and get around this was by trying to get through that first initial line of pressure and then... Uh, try and exploit the space that, that is left in behind. They're going to do this in two different ways. So one thing we saw was them trying to progress the ball, particularly in wide areas. So they're going to try and get the ball out here and then do these bounce combinations, sometimes third man combinations as well, just to get the ball through that initial line of pressure. And then you can try and find someone like Cole Palmer in space, in behind the fullback, uh, and then you can attack at speed. Okay, so let's look at some examples then. Yeah, so this is Chelsea building up this way down the field. The ball has just arrived at Rob Sanchez. And what we've got here is Reese James has come in between Doku and Bernardo Silva, as you can see here. Actually, it was quite nice because we've got Dezazi pulling Doku out of the way to create a little bit of space so that Reese James can sort of sit between the two of them to open up some space. What's going to happen is we're going to get one of those bounce passes. So Sanchez into Reese James, he's going to play it immediately to Thiago Silva. And Thiago Silva then has got time and space to turn, and he can just play a one-two with Reese James now. Playing into this space now, he's found the free man. That's what you're always trying to do in this build-up scenarios. And you've got a huge amount of space, as you can see, in front of him. So you've got through that first line of pressure, you're into space. And then what we can see here is it causes problems again for Man City. So Guardiol is on Cole Palmer. Does he go forward to Reese James to try and stop the pass at route? Or does he track Cole Palmer? He decides that he can maybe get to... Um, he decides he can maybe get to Reese James at that moment, but actually isn't able to get close enough. And then we see Palmer in a huge amount of space. You play the ball in behind, and then we get one of those dangerous uh, attacking plays from Chelsea. So that's one way. And then their other way of approaching the game directly was, was how? Yeah, so we talked about these direct attacks in wide areas, but also when you're playing against teams who are going to try and press you into the sidelines, so a lot of teams are going to squeeze across to try and make it really difficult for you to be able to build up in those situations, is that you can actually find these ways of, of moving the ball diagonally through the field. We saw Chelsea do this really well against Arsenal. Uh, and again, what you're trying to do is you're trying to bounce pass through the first line of pressure, but then you get these openings. So you've got Fernandez, Sterling in these sorts of lines. So you can move the ball wide and again, try and attack these, these wide areas as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why Chelsea are playing really aggressively and directly, because that's the best way of being able to beat these teams who press high up the field. So Chelsea were embracing the chaos with the ball. Um, playing through City's press like that, which is obviously quite risky, but without the ball, they also caused City quite a lot of problems when they were trying to build out, which obviously Guardiola would have hated, um, and it led to some individual mistakes as well. So talk me through what they were doing out of possession, which is obviously your favourite bit of these recordings. Obviously, obviously. obviously. So Chelsea have been playing in what we call generally an option-oriented approach. They're going to play in this 4-4-2 shape, so you've got two forward players and then a line of four behind them. It's option oriented because you're going to stay in a zonal system, but when players come into your zone, then you'll come, you'll, you'll be quite aggressive on them. And the reason that they're doing this is because often most elite teams are using very flexible build up structures, which allows them to pull players around. So we know that Man City like to invert one of their centre backs, mm -hmm. push them forward into this sort of space in behind that first line. Uh, and they, and you can maybe get the goalkeeper jumping up as well. And, the, the, and then in, in theory, right, because when Stones and Rodri, it's normally Stones in that position, right? When when they swap, you drag players with them and then that opens up space. That's and right, if yeah. that player can't follow them, then yeah. right. Yeah, and and so the idea here is that you're, you're, you're doing these rotations in order to try and destabilise the opposition. But actually what it is that Chelsea do really well is that in this scenario with Akanji dropping forward, it might be the case that you'd, you know, you'd expect Dr Jackson to drop back on him. Mm. But actually what we're going to see is Kai Sodo just saying, well, he's coming towards my zone now, so I'll step step forward a little bit and we can still retain this kind of shape. And what this actually did is it just made it quite hard for Man City to, to build up. Um, so they're trying to build up from the back. Often the ball was ending up with the feet of Diaz. You've got these two options quite aggressive um, in the wide areas. Uh, and the only thing that was left for Diaz is to sort of play fairly speculative balls into wide areas as well. So the combination of these two things then, Chelsea playing really direct, which means that they're going to be quite aggressive in their positioning as well. Man City not being able to do the controlled build-up that they're doing meant that Man City were often actually looking to hit the space in behind Chelsea in the same way that Chelsea were trying to hit the space in behind Man City. So that's why the game got so transitional, because actually City couldn't control the game through their deep build-up. And so they the ball just ended up basketballing mm. forwards right. and backwards. Do you think the game might have been different had 
different players been selected. Um, for example, um, Pep likes to play Grealish for control as he did against Manchester United, but he went with Doku, who's much more of a direct dribbler. Um, and obviously he was missing stones. So do you think that had an impact on how they had to approach a game? I think so, yeah. And I think when these games become transitional as well, it starts exacerbating problems that you might not usually see with certain players. So we've talked about John Stones not being around. John Stones is excellent at playing alongside Rodri because what this allows them to do then is to have a more controlled build-up where they're moving the ball through lines of pressure, finding free men and actually being able to move the ball through the centre of the field, which is which is much more dangerous, obviously. If you're left with Diaz having to play long balls into the channels to players like Doku and Foden, you're not going to be able to control the game quite so well. These sorts of fullbacks are going to be able to actually compete with them in those sorts of areas. Um, so missing stones is a big one, um, for, for sure. We also saw with the game getting quite transitional that it actually upset some of the players. They weren't playing at the sort of level that you might expect them to. Mm. In these kind of games, Rodri can look a little bit exposed sometimes because uh, his mobility isn't quite the level to look as controlled as he usually does. But I thought Ruben Diaz looked especially under a huge amount of pressure in the game because he was being put into scenarios that he's not usually put into and he was actually quite chaotic as well. Yeah, and even if he is put into those scenarios in other games, right, normally he has more options to get out of it, like having stones, right? Um, and he made a mistake under pressure um, that led to a goal that Gavardio also made a mistake in. Do you want to just talk us through those two incidents that led to um, Sterling's tapping? Yeah, so a few things happening here that I think just show the way that Man City players can be exposed with a little bit of pressure. So what we've got here is the run-up to the second goal that Chelsea score. So Rob Sanchez has taken a goal kick here and it's actually arrived at Walker who's played a fairly controlled header back to Ruben Diaz here. Now, Chelsea have done some interesting things here to try and pull that back line around. But as we can see, you've got four defenders in this area here around about three Chelsea attackers so not a huge amount of pressure that they're under here um, but Ruben Diaz because he's been pulled out of position the ball arrives at him in a bit of an awkward situation and he just ends up flapping at it so you can see here he's just sort of swung his foot at it and it ends up falling to the Chelsea player here and now you can see with the wide players coming in on the other side of the field this is going to become quite a dangerous situation we've got Guardiol here who's going to be become exposed quite quickly so you mentioned again Guardiol makes a mistake we have Cole Palmer here Guardiol almost playing as a left back uh, and I've drawn a line on the field here which is just the line the, the vertical line of the pitch from the ball and what actually ends up happening here is that Guardiol has gone on the wrong side of that line because I think usually as a as a fullback you're in you can be in a bit of danger if you get on the wrong side of that line because it opens up the possibility of an inside ball, um, which the the, out, the the Reece James in this case can just run around the back of. This becomes even more of a problem for Guardiola because that ball is played, and actually because he's had he's facing that way out towards the touchline, he has to turn around because the ball's come on the other side of him, he loses track of the ball and it actually bounces off the back of his heel, falls perfectly to Rhys James and uh, the ball can come across into this area for Sterling to tap in. So again, what we're seeing is because Manchester City are being destabilised, some of their players are making the sorts of decisions that you might not expect players at this level to make. And so the chaos actually means that, that Man City lose out a little bit more. Mm. So a combination of good pressure from Chelsea, good passing and a couple of individual mistakes, which everybody needs when you play Man City if you're going to score, right? Um, but also, obviously, part of this approach from Chelsea is that it leaves themselves exposed because... You know, as, you, as you've as you said many times, football tactics is all about trade-offs. If you're going to play like that against City, there's a risk that City will punish you for it. Um, and City scored four goals themselves. So uh, talk me through how they did that. So we've already talked about how Chelsea are pressing quite aggressively in their 4-4-2 four, four, press. Sometimes it can end up looking almost like a 4-2-4 four, four press because the wide players are going to get up onto the, the Manchester City fullbacks. And what this does then is it can leave space that can be exploited in these in these wide areas in particular in between the, the areas between the fullback and the wide forward uh, and what we saw a few times was Man City being able to exploit these sorts of situations so I've got a few examples of this happening for Chelsea now I want to start with one that happened last week uh, against Spurs because this is where the Spurs goal came from so this is Chelsea in their high press phase they're pressing this way down the field against Spurs and you can see here Cole Palmer nominally playing as the wide forward really high and aggressive in his positioning. This means that the, the area that he's supposed to be covering on the wing is, is open, and so Spurs are able to find Madison in that space. And because Palmer is so far off the play, that means the rest of the midfield has to shift around. That means you're gonna create a far side weakness. And what we see here from Madison is he can play the ball across here to Pat Matassar. And then you're in this situation now where you've got the Chelsea back line here, quite narrow. You've got five Spurs players running, most of them in between the line of the midfield and the defensive line. And what ends up happening is you can see 
Kulisevsky has a huge amount of space to get into and this causes problems for, for Chelsea. Presumably Man City tried to take advantage of the same kind of weakness. Yeah, so we saw this happening a little bit in the game itself. So this is um, just before the penalty is given for Manchester City's first goal. And again, we can see here's Cole Palmer. He's pressing quite aggressively high up on Guardiol. And so if we fast forward the take now 15 seconds, Man City actually win the ball back and they progress the ball down the field. But we can see again now we've got the Chelsea back four. Here's their midfield three with Sterling dropping in. No sign of Cole Palmer whatsoever. That's 15 seconds that have elapsed and it's allowed Man City to generate an overload in this wide area. Actually, this is the overload that results in the ball being crossed in for the penalty that's given away. So we can see that there is a possibility for Chelsea's um, structure to be broken down as well by going aggressive in the high press. Mm -hmm. And did Chelsea do anything to try to alleviate that kind of weakness? Like Gallagher started to move over to the right, didn't he? Because he's much more of a naturally kind of defensive thinking player. Yeah, that's exactly what we saw in the second half. So we saw Gallagher actually playing in the Cole Palmer position, Palmer more central. Now there's obviously in possession reasons why you might do that as well. But I think the probably the bigger prompt to do that is that they didn't want to allow these sorts of uh, weaknesses to open up. But there are also weaknesses from this approach anyway that we talked about, because if you're going to press high up against Man City, they are also very dangerous on the counter as well. So this is the uh, the third goal that Man City scored. And what we can see here is that Chelsea pressing super high up the field. Um, and what we've got here is Bernardo Silva receiving the ball. He's going to play the ball directly to Erling Haaland here. And because Caicedo here jumps in on Haaland, we have the same sort of situation where this weak, weakness on the far side opens up. So if we fast forward, we can see there's Caicedo jumping in to try and stop Haaland from being able to get ball progression. And now you're in that same situation where one ball into the middle, defended badly, actually ends up with this, with this far side weakness. Mm. So I think that's going to be something we maybe see happening with teams playing against Chelsea, trying to expose their high press. But one uh, interesting element of this goal that I think a lot of people might be confused by is why Caicedo is on Haaland at all and why Thiago Silva is all the way over here. So uh, is there a reason for that? Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, I don't know what the reason would be, but this is from a throw-in. So I assume what they've decided is that in this scenario, um, they would rather have Caicedo on Haaland um, man-to-man because as we see, when the ball gets to Haaland, he steps up on him and is quite aggressive. So maybe the idea here is that because we're going high and because Thiago Silva might not be as good tracking back defensively in these situations, they swap the position of, of Caicedo and, and Silva. Now, there's, it could also be the case that this has just happened after a set piece. Um, so a corner or something. So so Silver is is up there as well. But essentially, what they've done is they've just rotated. So we've got we've got Silver here and Caicedo here. And actually, if you run the tape on, you can see that Caicedo makes a very central midfielder decision mm. when the ball comes around the side when uh, Alvarez plays it across to actually step back and defend the edge of the box rather than the final line. And had it been Thiago Silva, he might have stepped into that final line and tried to actually block the the ball from coming across as well. Chelsea love playing teams that leave them space to attack into. Pep Guardiola hates chaos. Um, Chelsea are kind of on the up. Anything else? Like, What's your overall kind of takeaway from this, yeah. from this game? So as you mentioned, I think this is a really good example of why Pep Guardiola hates chaos because Man City, there was a few situations where they were able to control the game, but then Pochettino would make tweaks to destabilise things again. And it just makes it so much harder for Man City to get the, the best upside from the sorts of players that they have. And that's the best way of levelling the playing field, I think, against Manchester City, is by making the games chaotic, because then you have a much, you're much more likely to be able to compete with them. Now, that does result in a game like a four-all four draw, and it could have been a 4-3 win to Man City, so it could have gone wrong um, but were it not for that penalty right at the end. But this is why teams want to try and make games against Man City chaotic, because it, it's probably your best chance of going um, toe-to-toe with them. But I think what we've seen from Chelsea, a, a lot of people are making... Um, a lot of sweeping statements about Chelsea off the back of this result. But I think what we've seen from Chelsea this season is that they are quite competitive against teams that press up high because they have that ability to to play bounce passes quickly through the lines. Um, they can switch the ball from one side to the other into runners. They're really aggressive players as well. So this sort of game is what is going to suit them. Yeah. Um, another thing we could take away is John Stones is going to be a big miss for, for Manchester City, I think, um, because they weren't able to actually dominate the game in the, in the deeper build-up because... They're missing his ability on the ball. And then, yeah, the other thing is, are we going to start seeing Chelsea come a cropper against teams that actually realise that they have these weak weaknesses on the far side? If they can break quickly against them and switch the play, it could lead to them mm. uh, conceding goals as well. And, and if they struggle to break down low blocks um, or high lines of seven, as they did last weekend, then that could 
create a quite a weird season for them where they like get good results against the big boys and struggle against the smaller teams like I remember Klopp's Liverpool in their early stages kind of struggled with the same thing where they really enjoyed the end-to-end -end transitional games where you know Salah could run into space but they played Burnley once had 80% possession and lost 2-0 so um, is that that's quite that's just quite common among the early stages of this sort of team right especially with such a young team but hopefully they might from a for Chelsea's point of view hopefully they might get over that and start to dominate games more yeah I think there's a reason why Pep likes to, uh, con to control games and that is because when you control games it's easier to come out on top in most games right and I think that Pochettino is going to find the same thing like as we've said you can if you can create chaos and you can benefit from that chaos you're going to win games against some of the better teams but being a top team isn't about creating chaos and coming out on top it's about actually consistently winning games and there comes a point which we see all managers go through right Jurgen Klopp went through it Eddie Howe is going to have to go through it with Newcastle. And I think Pochettino is going to have to go through it as well, which is, OK, this sort of style of play is going to be good in knockout competitions, but if you want to challenge at the top of the Premier League, you have to have a, maybe a little bit more consistency in terms of what you're doing in possession as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, John. Thanks, Ruben. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.